Hey Gaias, welcome to Rewild, where we talk environment, psychology, and other interesting things. And I thought today we would talk a bit about eco-psychology and ecotherapy, which is really the point of this station. And I don't know, I like to yap about all kinds of stuff from politics to environment in general, and even social justice or public interest stories and celebrity gossip. And as I've been developing this station over the last few years, I feel a little bit torn. Part of me wants to jump on trends like talking about psychology and ethics in pop news media stories, but I realized I really do want to start teaching a little bit more about ecotherapy and eco-psychology, as much as I don't love how jargony those words sound. So my hope today is this can just be a short little podcast introducing you to the idea of ecotherapy and to give you a bit of an introduction for how you can do ecotherapy at home and how you can gently and easily integrate that into your day-to-day life. So I think that ecotherapy, and that is using the environment and ecology to heal ourselves uh, on a holistic and especially mental health level, It's a pretty intuitive concept. I think that it's something that has to exist because it's in response to modern times and how we have been divorced from nature in modern times. My background in eco-psychology, in that academic community, we talk a lot about how nature is vilified. A lot of Abrahamic religions will sometimes see nature as something to be subjugated or in modern architecture and urban environments. You listen and read historical descriptions of nature. It's often described as even being wild and scary and even feminine in some aspects where there's a sense of vilification. And that's something that can be seen in historic examples of the way we talk about nature, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, or people who hate camping because the bugs and like whatever the discomfort, right? We are comfort creatures and I don't really fault anybody out there who, like me, might prefer to be in the shade or stay in an air-conditioned room during a heat wave for which we are having more and more as climate collapse is upon us. However, from an eco-psychologic perspective, one of the ways that we can start to reconnect and heal our planet and heal ourselves vicariously at the same time is to acknowledge how we relate to nature and how that disconnect of seeing nature as something we are apart from even though we're organisms, right? (laughs) We are organisms, we are animals, we are part of the animal kingdom biologically. We are more genetically related than not in terms of our genetic structure, what it means to be alive. So being in nature, it seems obvious, but I think on a deeper academic kind of nerdy level (laughs) in these communities I've studied in, we're really looking at this not just Oh man, I'm yapping. I'm sorry. This, it's abstract concepts, so it's really hard to like just be succinct. But basically, we need to get out there, and it's easy to forget. And I think there are people who take it for granted, who never lost that sense of nature and wonder. But increasingly, a lot more of us, especially those of us who are chronically online, especially younger generations like myself, I'm a millennial, Gen Z, Gen Alpha those of us who've been like highly wired and plugged into internet and even television, we tend to see the world through these screens sometimes more than actually experiencing it. Now, I'm not encouraging people to do anything dangerous. I think part of the reason a lot of people are holed up at home in some ways because of global health crisis or because of perceptions in increased levels of crime, which may or may not be reflective of data-driven reality. But we do need to get outside more, and I think it's fair, even though it's an obvious thing to say, that we need to interface with nature more, I myself included. Mm -hmm. It may be obvious, but it is also something that we will have to 
integrate into our lives as if we are out of practice because I think sociologically as a species we truly are one of the most important reasons I think for all of us benefiting from eco-psychology and eco-therapy it's not just for ourselves and that is an aspect of eco-psychology that I find a bit radical and novel within alternative psychology community because when you start to engage with this type of material whether you're coming at it from an academic or a self-healing self-help perspective i'm not personally like in my philosophical perspective of this stuff i'm not actually asking people or encouraging people to reconnect with nature just to heal themselves i think that is also the way we get critical mass of radical and frankly revolutionary awareness of the importance of healing our environments and what i mean by that i used to work for social services where we were serving homeless community populations and we would talk about this thing called proximity consciousness and in the field when you're observing proximity consciousness that is the effect that it has on you as an individual with your level of compassion and awareness about the world around you as a result of interfacing with it really intimately. And in the context I was working in, that was what we saw when you regularly worked with homeless folks, for example, houseless community. If you're feeding people a lot, if you are helping and doing donations, trying to help get people housing. And unlike the rest of the world around us that typically avoids homeless folks like they're toxic or contagious and part of the most damaging part of that experience for people is the way they we are socially ostracized during that time in life and I I could do lots of podcasts on that experience so I'll try not to soapbox on it too much today but just as an example a person who has shook the hand of a houseless person, met their eyes, introduced themselves, knows the name of their houseless neighbor, goes to local food drives, listens to people's stories, and actually spends time with folks who are on the street, they're going to have a much deeper sense of compassion, awareness, and mutualistic humanity and mutual aid towards these folks than someone who has never ever met or spoken to a homeless person to their knowledge in their life. And I say to their knowledge because I think we live in a world where the example of homelessness, again, not trying to soapbox on this one topic, but it is so publicly humiliating and ostracizing. It's a form of social exile that I'm losing my train of thought here. (laughs) I'm just imagining people who don't want to hear about this. I came to hear about the environment, not not people who are struggling, but that's part of our environment too, right? Again, we are the organisms. We are part of a social species with a social hierarchy. And uh, we're gonna be political here in saying this, but homeless folks exist in an engineered sense socially. There is enough housing to house everybody. We know that through data. There are more empty homes and vacant houses owned by corporations than homeless people on the street, it would be very easy logistically, just in terms of resources, for us to end homelessness tomorrow. It's not a matter of like people choosing that or, oh, because you're on drugs, like the chicken or the egg thing, right? Because that type of experience makes you so disconnected socially that it's difficult to stay sane and that can feed into addiction and so on and so forth. So there's a cause and effect there. And I think that I apply this idea of proximity consciousness to eco-psychology in the sense that when you start to develop a relationship with the outside, an intimate relationship, and I don't mean just, oh, I'm going for a hike and I like it and I'm a hiker, but when you hike, you learn, or at least spiritually, psychically, emotionally commune with all of the things that are living around you You pay attention to the seasons and the cycles, how healthy your favorite trees are looking in your favorite places, what's going on environmentally for you in these places. And as you can hear in the background, I'm slightly distracted by my very urban, loud, noisy environment where trees and grass and nature 
can feel a little inaccessible and far and few between. And that's something else that I want to bring up a lot in this station as we go forth moving past a light introduction of eco-psychology, environmental psychology, and ecotherapy is like the nitty gritty of the basics because I really do think we're living in like a ready player one world and people who still commune with nature, it shouldn't be a club. It shouldn't just be for only people who are into gardening or people who are outdoorsy. Like this notion that nature is only for certain types who like it, I think is profoundly sad. Like it really speaks to a bizarre, I almost want to say like colonial, modern, industrial, almost like haze that exists over us. And and I, I don't mean to sound conspiratorial. I know there's like a lot of conspiracy theorists who are going to eat that up and go, hell yeah. And yeah, like it's weird. It feels like a mass hypnosis that nature's dangerous. I don't want to get too hot. I don't want to get bitten by bugs. I don't want to get lost in the woods. And frankly, too, on the flip side of that, in an ethical standpoint, when I did my wilderness solo with Naropa University, for example, we definitely had to talk about safety and we had a classmate get sick in the field and not be able to finish her spiritual, psycho-spiritual journey with us in the same capacity she had hoped to. And we had to do buddy systems and watch out for bears and be careful. So nature is dangerous too. And I think it's worth validating that also anybody who loves spending a lot of time outdoors, especially deep back country, especially survivalist types. Like we also all know that it's not a joke. <laughs> the deeper you go, the more you better know your, you better know your stuff. He's going to swear, but we're trying to keep it for the kids also. <laughs> but anyway, I want to keep this very short, this intro and I do a lot of twisty, windy, weavy like discussions, like kind of coffee on the back porch yapping. So if that's your style and if you're interested in learning from me, I invite you into this space. Like I said early in this um, episode, I want to start focusing more on being succinct and staying on one topic, but also focusing more deeply on eco-psychology and environment as that niche. We'll still maybe talk about P. Diddy and like shallow stuff, not shallow, but pop culture things once in a while, because I think it's important for us to apply weird academic niche concepts to things that are more universally understood and accessible to the everyman, if that makes sense. So I'll still go on those tangents. Plus, I'm going to talk about whatever I want anyway, but I want to try to stay focused on this topic for this station because I I think it's helpful. I I got an education in this because I knew that in my gut, in my na'al, we say in Hawaii as a part indigenous person, this is really important. This is the foundation of all life itself. I don't think the stock market runs everything. I know the earth does. And I know that might sound cheesy to some, but the internet and the stock market and those numbers and that money and all of those resources, if we don't have oxygen, if we don't have forests to produce the oxygen, if the oceans are boiling, like none of those numbers will ever matter, right? And they're going to be finance bros. I don't know how a finance bro would stumble on this podcast. Obviously, there will be people who disagree with that based on their expertise. And that's okay, right? We all have our biases. But one of the big things that I hope to bring to the forefront in discussions around eco-psychology and environmental psychology in general is that we are so connected and it's very simple in theory and maybe simple in day-to-day practices if you think about a meditation practice or a therapy or a skill set practice like practicing every day that reconnection to environment to earth to living things around you talk to animals the idea the western colonial and like strange supposedly academic scientific perspective that we shouldn't anthropomorphize life i think it also extends out in a pendulum swing that we shouldn't negate the fact that all life is connected either and indigenous people not to fetishize that or to make it too rosy but historically indigenous folks have typically had a better grasp of that and had not always but most of the time a greater sense of 
environmental balance in terms of what environmental, human environmental impacts look like. An example I'll give from back home uh, in Hawaii was the kapu system, which was a religious system that was a bit strict and restrictive and hierarchical at times, but it also importantly functioned for environmental and natural resource preservation. So these months out of the year, you don't fish in this place, right? We don't chop trees in this area. We ask plants permission before we harvest them. Those kind of laws. And those values don't exist in our world anymore. And in some senses, and we'll just be slightly political here again, just so you know what kind of station you're on. But in some instances, there have been discussions around modern Western, Greco-Roman, Plato, Socrates ideology, how that is percolated into Western superpower, colonial powers to this day. And these hierarchies, they really fall into these interesting lines. When we look at the rights of nature, the rights of human beings, the rights of people based on what their bodies look like, the hue of their skin, their gender, who is a slave class and who is a leader, who is allowed to profit and whose labor do they profit from and off of, and is that ethical? And what natural resources are these entities or individuals or corporations that we give personhood to what are they allowed to harvest and in what capacity? If I'm Coca-Cola and I want to put, I don't know, co- Coca back in the bottles and I'm going to go harvest a lot of Coca and do that, I don't know, change, lobby the laws, I'm kidding. But if I'm a paper mill company or if I am, you know, in the Amazon, clear-cutting forests, is that a corporation or even an individual's right to decimate a public commons that creates 20% of the world's oxygen for us all. Who owns that oxygen, yeah? Who owns oxygen? And these are some of the very, very radical questions that I don't know if all eco-psychologists, I think most of us like to talk about this stuff, but I recognize that it does fall on political lines. And to some extent, that is me. So if that's not for you, I know we're in a really hot time politically, that's totally okay. I just might not be the eco-environmentalist for you, but also I think it's natural to look at the rights of all living things through this lens. The rights of nature for people like myself are very valid. The rights of animals, the rights of all human beings, regardless of their color, their class, their shape, their religion, that is very important. And I think at least for me as an indigenous person, as an eco-psychologist, that is how one integrates to their own ecology and their own systems and their own social fabric, is that we are, we're all one, which I know is like some new age stuff, and is an offshoot of transpersonal psychology, which recognizes a more holistic collectivist lens in the therapies Because typically in Western culture and in modern culture, when we think of psychology, when we think of psychologists, we think of, I don't know, Shutter Island, (laughs) like in the worst case, or Nurse Ratchets or whatever, tell me about your childhood therapist, right? One-on-one individual therapy that tends to focus on childhood trauma, which is nothing wrong with that. That has its place and it is valuable in some contexts. But an eco-psychologist and a transpersonal psychologist will also ask you to look at your family system. What were the family dynamics that might have led to feeling a certain way? What are the cultural dynamics? What are the cult dynamics? A lot of people, a lot of us are in cults or have left cults or were born into cults. We don't even realize it. A cult is not necessarily bad, but it's worth understanding the definition of one because if you're ever in one, they will tell you you're not. What are the dynamics of even mass psychosis. When we look at collectivist understanding of mental being and environmental well-being, there is also an important case to be made for the all in the small and the health of all of us together, right? When the kofefe hit the fan years ago, none of us were likely doing very well mentally, right? Because we were all experiencing a collective trauma and collective traumas happen to families, couples, uh, whole communities, whole races of people, and entire countries, and entire generations. 
So that's part of the transpersonal piece, I think, in eco-psychology is you can't really just go out in nature and meditate and go, oh, I'm better now. I feel better. I had a rough day at work. I yelled at my secretary. I'm the stock market's not doing good. I'm going to go sit under a tree and drink some tea. And now I feel better and I can get back to work. No, that's not quite the whole picture at least not for me. And I don't I think I'm like third wave eco psychology now at this point. It's about 30 or 40 years old. So relatively new, but what I'm adding to the the picture might not be all eco psychologists philosophy on this, but mine personally is that we don't deserve nature unless we also tend to it. The collapse of our biosphere is a direct result not only of our disconnection from the laws of nature and balance and understanding of ecology and equality, frankly, and the rights of life in general, that collapse is happening because of arrogance also. <laughs> I think like a superiority complex that human beings and certain classes and races of people sometimes seem to have. And th that hierarchy and that superiority and the idea that your individual story, your mental health is all that matters. Your health is the only health you have to worry about. There is a thing called internal locus of control. And yeah, you're the only person who can control your own behaviors. You're the only one who's like in charge of your well-being ultimately. But that doesn't mean you are not responsible for the communion and the relationships and what you would call it the polina that you have with everyone and everything else around you. And you will not be healthy if your backyard is not healthy, if things aren't going well. And for some of us, this is actually a therapeutic truth because some people feel very depressed during climate change and don't know why and blame themselves and think they're weird. And I think if any of you are feeling a climate catastrophe stress, you are the red blood cells in the body of the earth, right? Like we, we all are. And it is not a sign of mental illness, in my opinion, to feel intense anxiety and unrest around the collapse of our ecosystems and our habitats. If you are reacting with a sense of concern, panic, empathy, sadness, depression, rage, disassociation, any of those myriads of different things that we tend to associate with mental illness, and you're reacting to a stimulus in a rational way, it's not mental illness. I would wager, and this is a radical thing to say again, it actually seems stranger to me that we are not doing anything about climate collapse as a species. What I mean by that, nothing's a monolith, but we collectively are not doing enough to tilt the scales back in the favor of our species thriving collectively. We're too, too distracted by God knows what else. That's a podcast for another day. Why are we not doing anything? What is going on? I don't have all the answers, but I do ruminate on this stuff a lot to have some or some pretty good ideas. So I hope you stick around. I hope you continue this conversation. Leave comments. Give me your thoughts on this because one of the important parts I think about healing collectively and individually together is we all have very different perspectives and all of our experiences meant for our personal healing they're all valid um, not all of our biases are valid not all of our intent you know, i think a lot of our intentions are all good maybe execution requires more i would say collectivist thought and consensus in order to really know what we're doing to be mindful and demure and approachable i'm sorry <laughs> But yeah, the, uh, I guess that's all for today. I'm practicing, not stumbling on my words. I don't really want to record these with notes. I find it difficult for the way my brain works. And I appreciate those of you who like like rambly stuff like this. So I'll try to just close this one up. Thank you so much for listening. I hope something in this short little introductory to eco-psychology and environmental health and mental health and social health sparked your curiosity and that this iceberg tip is interesting to you because there is so much more we could get into and I'm really excited to offer what I have to share with folks, especially aspects of eco-psychology and environmentalism you're interested in. So keep up the good fight. If you're one of those of us who are praying and actively working to help rebalance our natural systems, 
And if you're not, and you just stumbled in here and you're new, hey, hey, hello, welcome. And one small thing that you can do today, as I promised, a small eco-therapy, self-help, home therapy thing you can do is just either go outside or check out if you have house plants or if you have a small backyard, even if you live in Japan in a tiny apartment, but you have a small planter box in your home or a favorite tree that's planted in a highway median or something it doesn't have to be deep nature for today this is something i always like to remind people is notice the nature all around you that you don't always acknowledge notice the sidewalk crack flowers notice the stones outside of your local taco bell if you're in an urban area if you're not like howdy ho i'm probably pe preaching to the choir and maybe you have a whole forest r restoration thing happen in your, your backyard or you have favorite trails in the back country you're going to. And I, I don't even need to tell you how to um, go commune. You already have that privilege. But for those of us who don't, who either were born in or who have moved into urban areas, which is about half of humanity, I think a really great start for making eco-psychology accessible to everyone, regardless of race or class or income, is to start to notice everything that's alive around us in a more mindful way. Notice, acknowledge, and honor. The stray cats, the, the little spiders, the, whatever life is around you because you would be surprised how integral that is. Bugs are going extinct on our planet and it is affecting our food supply as pollinators. Cats protected us from the Black Plague and are excellent hunters of other species that carry diseases for us and so there's a reason we have relationships with animals that are companion animals and different species that have evolved together with us when you eat your salad today think about where it came from even if it was shipped from far away thank the people who picked it so i hope that gives you a little bit of like nice beautiful meditation juice for the day and i look forward to meeting anybody that is interested in this topic and continuing the conversation. Take care of yourself and we'll see you next time.